Hey everyone, I'm your host, Adrian. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. And with that, folks, let's go ahead and jump in. I would like to introduce Dr. Cheryl Burdett. Dr. Burdett is the Director of Education in the Naturopathic Residency Program at Progressive Medical, one of the largest integrative clinics in the Southeast. She is the co-founder and educational director of a functional laboratory, Precision Point Diagnostics, for which she designs clinical profiles and trains clinicians on utilization. She's on the board of advisors for Zymogen, an Inc. 500 supplement company. She is a partner in Theradura, a physician line distribution in Germany. She serves on IRB boards, is involved in study study design and translational research and has lectured extensively worldwide. She designed and teaches the clinical curriculum for Origins Incubator, a practice management group. Her passion is teaching about the practices of integrated and naturopathic medicine to increase awareness of evidence-based natural therapies. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Burdett. I will go ahead and let you take it from here. Do what you eat amazing how often the answer to that question is no. And eating is, of course, something that we do probably at least twice a day, some people six times a day. Sure, there's some intermittent fasting in there um, if we're having some of the, you know, the best practices kind of thing. But it is such an opportunity to really change what's going on with people. And I can think back 20 plus years ago when I first graduated from uh, naturopathic medical school and really like observing these clinicians that seem to make such such positive changes in people's lives and some would be highly evidence-based and very researched in their approach and some are very eclectic with crazy hair and lots of uh, well naturopathic uh, styles of treatment but yet no matter the, the ones that I found having the most clinical success seem to have maybe not so much in common except for an absolute focus on diet and an absolute focus on food. And I think when our patients say to us, uh, this is overwhelming, there's too many pills, there's too many potions, I don't know if I can keep up with all of it, then that's the moment that we say to them, well, that means you've got to be even better, even stricter, even more on top of your diet and strict for a moment in time. But I think that tools like this that we're going to talk about, food sensitivity plus allergy testing plus a couple bonuses in there, um, allow us to have that strictness initially. But the goal is of elimination diets or food testing is actually not to put people on the most restricted diet ever. The, the goal is to put them on the least inflammatory diet possible. And when they do that for an amount of time and work with things to build their gut lining, what that allows then is ultimately to bring that rainbow of food back in. The goal is to open up the diet to as many healthy foods as possible without distress, without discomfort, without inflammation that leads to more pathology. And so any advances we can make in this area are um, supported by the evidence and the research, despite what we hear from time to time, and there are so meaningful in terms of empowering the patient so that they can uh, so so they can do just that. They can take their health into their own hands and find those next steps. So my background uh, was shared with you and I'm co-founder of Precision Point Diagnostics, but I'm also educational director of Progressive Medical. And Progressive Medical is the place that the lab was birthed out of. And I think that that's an important consideration because the lab was birthed uh, from clinicians and at Progressive Medical, it's an integrative clinic uh, owned uh, and operated by my partner, Dr. Gezagoli. Um, and he ha had this vision 30 plus years ago at a time when integrative medicine wasn't as successful. And so they are one of the major things that we do is we work with people on diet. Not only do you meet with a dietitian at the first visit, but you meet with them at the second visit, at the third visit, at least your first six visits, we want you meeting with someone who's going to do intensive dietary work with you and the way we structure this. And so because of that, at our clinic, we have worked with many food sensitivity tests throughout the market and found great benefit and a lot that we've utilized. But as we did that, we said, you know, something's missing. There could be more. I think that there, it's not a complete picture. And so I think about 
practitioners maybe 40, 60 years ago who only had, for example, cholesterol when evaluating cardiovascular disease and how far we've come with that. And the science around foods has come just as far. Uh, maybe it, it might not be shouted quite as strongly out there in the general community, but it doesn't mean that this practice isn't evidence-based. And so let's walk through some of what we've learned along the way. So why does it matter? Well, the first reason it matters is because Hippocrates told us years ago, and we're so familiar with this, let food be thy medicine. And as I was mentioning, my observation has been that the best clinicians, the ones that are able to help their patients the most, are the ones that really understand and, and guide their patients in terms of this dietary change. But of course, we all know it's difficult. They come in, they've read 10 books, they say 10 different things, they don't know what to eat anymore, not to mention the internet. And so when we can draw blood and look at exactly what their body is reacting to, it can really help to move the conversation forward. And, uh, and also just, you know, kind of underscoring this idea, when we look, what is the most common style of test that's run in functional medicine? It is some type of testing that looks at dietary changes, that looks at foods that the body is reacting to. And so we've developed some new technology around this. You can uh, see that the, this crazy device pictured over here to the left is part of that. And I'll talk more about that. But I want you to know that we are launching this exclusively through Rupa. And with that um, promotion, with that uh, launch, we're there, they are offering a promotion to you guys of 50% uh, off this test through the end of December. So you can take a chance to look at it, see what you think, and uh, hopefully it moves your practice forward as we have seen at uh, Progressive. So uh, what we know is that the problem's not going away, and these statistics are pretty, um, you know, commonplace to those of you who are listening. We know allergies are increasing, that 50 billion people in the U.S. have allergies right now, and that just means IgE uh, testing, IgE uh, allergies, it does not include IgG sensitivities. We don't get as much good data there. Uh, we know worldwide sens sensitivities are increasing, that allergens among children are up to 40 to 50 percent. We know that England saw, for example, a 75 percent increase in anaphylaxis. We know that visits in the U.S. have had a threefold increase in the last decade. So we're becoming more and more sensitized. Now, maybe you're sitting there saying, well, how much does that really matter um, if it's something that's mediated by IgE? Are, aren't we born? Aren't we born with that and stuck with that? And in fact, the answer is no. There are things that we can do to even decrease IgE allergies, and we'll look at that. And so, testing is not just academic; it can guide us in terms of practices as well. Um, the CDC says between. 1997 and 2011, that there, there was an increase in food allergies in children up to 50%, and it's still increasing. And in fact, some of the uh, advice around how we introduce foods has changed because of that. We'll look at that. And it's not just allergies, it's also autoimmunity as well. Uh, so next time you're sitting there and you're, you know, wondering and looking for something to search on your phone, look up autoimmunity and how much it's skyrocketed in the U.S. in the past 40 years. It, it has gone radically up. And as our researchers tell us, genetics have not shifted in that, in that time. So it's not a genetic change that's caused this. And what they point to is, da da da, da no big surprise, uh, uh, the Western diet, and we'll examine some of why uh, it's so problematic. Now, if you have been in the, the functional medicine space, the integrative naturopathic medical space for um, in, even a short amount of time, but let's say a decade or two or three, then you know this story. You know that people would come to you. They would say, I hurt or I have symptoms with particular foods. And you would say, hmm, maybe you're having some type of reaction like a sensitivity. And they'd go, no, no, no. I've already done food testing. Um, I, I've looked at what I'm reacting to. And my, my last doc says I am not having any allergies. And we would explain to them that there's more than allergies. There are also sensitivities. And maybe 
maybe we do some type of testing around that. We would remove those IgG food sensitivities and they would feel better. They'd go back to some other practitioner. They'd talk to them about how their depression was in remission. They would talk to them about how their IBS had resolved. And that practitioner might say, there's no such thing as food sensitivities. That's made up. And um, that couldn't be further from the truth. I, I tell you, if I, as I did this research 20 years ago and looked at IgG sensitivities in PubMed and what the data was, there was still data at that moment in time. But when we do that today, and we'll walk through some of that, the data has really sped up. When we are doing removal based on food sensitivities, we are engaging in an evidence-based practice. And I need to look no further for that evidence than an immunology book. So we can see that the immune system can be confused in a number of ways. We can see that there's type one, type two, type three sensitivities. We can see that that can happen with IgE or IgG and that that can be driven by complement as well. But for some reason, some practitioners are stuck in the dark ages insisting that only allergies exist. But again, as soon as you open up an immunology book, you see that's not the case, that there are multiple ways the immune system can be confused and the data certainly supports that. And so we're familiar with these kind of schematics that, that will tell us about 85% of the immune system that resides in the gut. And I think that that's really an important message to drive home to our patients because we might realize that, but they're thinking immune function happens when you draw blood and look at a white count. And that's certainly part of it. But the secretory IgA that exists in the gut lining is critical for how the rest of our immune system behaves. So here we see a schematic with my one of my all-time favorite interventions, fiber being broken down into these short chain fatty acids. And if that occurs, it sends a signal down <clears throat> to the, uh, uh, through the, the, lining here, those short chain, chain fatty acids will actually block inflammasomes from occurring. However, um, if we begin to see the gut break down and we begin to have foods leak through intact and or bacteria or other bugs leak through intact, we're well aware this will activate these naive T cells and we're off to the inflammatory races. And this is the concept of leaky gut. So this is one way we become sensitive to foods and people often may have a conception that uh, these uh, that food sensit that that the only way we get a food sensitivity is through a leaky gut, but that is actually not true. If a food hits these pyres patches, and if there's not good cueing in terms of healthy good bacteria or even adequate amounts of secretory IgA, this is another reason we will begin to make reactions to foods. And so the idea that the only way that we get a sensitivity is a leaky gut is not entirely true. It's part of it. And this can be one of the reasons it can be important to test. Now, I myself as a clinician will use elimination and detail detox diets. Absolutely. In fact, at Progressive, one of the major things we do is we start with diet right away. As soon as you come in the door, we talk to you about eliminating inflammatory foods. But we will, in most cases, look at drawing some blood. So when they come back and they finish that process, we can now do an individualized, customized diet for what's going on with them and continue that work of lowering the inflammatory load through foods. Now, an interesting fact is if you're eating foods you're sensitive to, of course, it wears down this lining. Part of that is you'll see a decrease in, for example, secretory IgA. When secretory IgA goes down, this is another thing that will cause your allergies and sensitivities driven by IgE and IgG to be amplified. And so a good gut lining is critical if we're doing an elimination diet and we continue to eat foods we're sensitive to, it will continue to break down that lining and it will continue to amplify these reactions. And so really removing those irritants to the lining becomes important in terms of calming an overactive immune system and regulating one that is less reactive than it should be. And so it's interesting that even though we've seen uh, allergies skyrocket, uh, what the new guidelines are in terms of pediatrics for things that are more allergenic like peanuts is to introduce them earlier. So if allergies are worse, why are we seeing this earlier introduction? 
Well, part of the rationale is because this might be a time when there's still some level of breastfeeding going on. And if someone's still breastfeeding, the, one of the things that happens because of that is there's still a lot of immunoglobulins that they are passing along uh, to <clears throat> baby as well as that nurturing of the microbiome. And so uh, one of the things that we know is that when we have a healthier microbiome and removing food sensitivities, removing irritation is one of the things that helps our bacteria to take over. But when we have a healthier microbiome, it allows food allergies to calm down. So for example, here, uh, when kiddos did desensitization over 18 months, one group got probiotic, the other group didn't. But the group that, that got um, probiotic, 82% of them became tolerant to peanuts, whereas only 4% um, acquired tolerance if they did not get a probiotic. So I say that to say our work is not merely food removal, but to work on the gut lining as well, as well to build those things up. And it, it's our community that are doing those things together. And even in the case of a peanut allergy, you can see those things normalize as we see here in this research. So those that got probiotic plus desensitization and those uh, they got short-term tolerance, but those that also got the pro probiotic, 70% um, had long-lasting proven tolerance even four years after stopping treatment. And my point is that yes, we can retrain the immune system. Yes, we can do things like desensitization to cause the immune system to not recognize things in the same way. And yes, we're gonna look at studies where food removal does something similar. So we're not stuck in place. Uh, we hear some celiac patients who did probiotics and what they saw was that the probiotics uh, created a prolinopeptidase, an enzyme that chewed up gliadin and made them less reactive. So these celiac patients actually ate baked goods with wheat and had less reactivity um, when probiotics were combined with that. So just underscoring how our work with leaky gut is so important and we can see changes in, in some of the worst case scenarios. So even allergies aren't permanent. Uh, Gut-based approaches will improve an IgE response it's not just IgG. And unfortunately, what we know is the best IgE test in the world um, from journals of, uh, I'm sorry, from Annals of Immunology will tell you that only 50% of the time is there a correlation between a titer and a symptom with IgE. What does that mean? Well, that means 50% of the time uh, that, that it's, we're going to miss it. And so we need other ways of examining what's happening with foods. And so that is the birth of precision point diagnostics um, testing. We're going to look at the, the multitude of ways that we measure reactions to foods, but I wanna share with you this new development in terms of collection. And so if you uh, take advantage of this offer and the 50% off, this is the kit that's going to show up. This is a kit that the patient can use on their own. And there's a tiny little needle, smaller than even most diabetic needles, where they will stick their finger. And in fact, this was developed by a PhD who was watching his diabetic father struggle with collection. He'd poke himself, he'd scar, larger needles, still not getting the specimen he needed. So he thought, what can we do to advance this field? So he's like, first of all, it needs to not hurt. I'm tired of watching my dad in pain. And we know too, whenever things hurt more, we're going to have more difficult difficulty um, with compliance, getting the information we need. So the more the science is paramount, we need to have the best testing out there, but it needs to be in a form that's realistic for a patient to use. You could have the most fabulous science, but if it requires me um, to draw um, fluid from cerebral spinal fluid, it's not going to be that useful to me because it's too invasive. And so that's a bit extreme of an example, but we know that reality, the difficulties, if I've got to drive somewhere, if I need to come a week early to get this done and then come back to get my results, all of those things, uh, maybe I can't ship on a certain day, um, maybe it can only be done certain days of the week, maybe I need to freeze ice packs, all of these things become a hindrance to getting the information we need to do the best work possible. So he watched his dad struggle and he thought, I'm going to do something about that. So he's like, first, the tiniest needle ever. Okay. But tiniest needle ever can often mean uh, less blood is, it, it comes out. So what he thought next was, 
What about a sponge? And so the, this is what's called an activated tip. So these tips feel and look a lot like a sponge. They've got a, a, a roller ball inside there. So a, a bit more than just a, a sponge or a Q-tip. And then he thought, uh, how do I create more diffusion? And he, and, he, and he thought, ah, capillary bed. So we're just done with Thanksgiving. We think about a turkey baster. You squeeze the end and release. Or for us, we think about um, pipette to squeeze the end and release, and that that's that capillary flow um, uh, uh, flow dynamics. And so the same is true here, just moving from a smaller space to a larger space, and the way that this is formulated inside means it will it's activated. It will pull blood into uh, this tube that you see. So without a phlebotomist, we can collect a reasonable amount of specimen that allows us to do very extensive testing. So what we're going to look at is on the precision food test we're measuring 352 independent reactions to foods. That's a lot of testing. And so in the past, uh, really doing this through a standard like finger stick card where you just put it on paper was never going to be enough specimen to get um, enough result or an accurate result. This solves that problem. So using this technology allows us to get the specimen that we need to really do complete testing around foods, not just allergies, but sensitivities. So once we'd utilize this tip and you see these four independent tubes here, um, that means that we can look at four independent ways that your body reacts to foods. And the first is IgE, like I mentioned, and uh, it's important. Many of us might uh, not do IgE testing as much. We feel like maybe it was done somewhere else, uh, maybe, um, you know, maybe people know because it should be an immediate reaction. If I eat a strawberry, my lips should swell immediately. But first of all, the standard research that's utilized, um, and we're going to look at some of this data, says, you know what? Uh, the, the, the very standard technology that's used by the big guys uh, called Immunicap, it's not very sensitive. So even though we know allergies are increasing, <clears throat> you're not necessarily seeing more come back on testing because the large scale testing that's been adopted is not as sensitive as it should be. In fact, on our test, um, a low level would not even show up on that testing. A high level would be the beginning of a low level of something you could expect to get back from more of the larger big labs out there, the Qs and the Ls of the world where people might go get a blood draw and do IgE testing. <clears throat> and so we don't expect to see an acute symptom unless there is a high value. And so in terms of lows and moderates, that's not something we're gonna see someone's lip swell or anaphylaxis or whatnot. And so now as a clinician, you're thinking, well, why would you even give me that information then IgE, what I'm taught is people should always avoid this and it could be <clears throat> anaphylactic and it could be and cause shortness of breath and a trip to the emergency room. You just reviewed that data about how those trips to the emergency room are radically escalating. So why would you give us this information? Well, for the same reason that I would give you information about a hemoglobin A1C before it was a 6.7, uh, for the same reason I might give you information about a, 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 a glucose, um, even if it's not 102, it's just 98 fasting, because we can see trends. So when you see low and moderate levels of IgE, it's not necessarily that they're going to have an anaphylactic reaction. However, it does tell you that this, this patient is more TH2 tipped, and we might not remove all those foods, but we think about what can decrease a TH2 response. Well, ultimately, anything that increases IL-10 will do that. In fact, this is very well known. If you're sitting there thinking, is that accurate what she said, that we can reduce IgE allergies? Absolutely. Why else would the whole school of desensitization exist if that were not true? And, and again, it's not even avoidance, it's giving small amounts of the food to provoke a reaction. So when we do desensitization, the whole intent of that therapy is to increase IL-10, which makes us less reactive. The way that we increase IL-10 is those smaller amounts will increase IgG subtype 4. 
And we'll talk about that more in a minute. That is the way that desensitization injections work. However, we're not just stuck with desensitization injections. In fact, omega-3s increase IL-10, your probiotics increase IL-10, like we saw in the study with peanuts and desensitization and probiotics, they work better together because they would be synergistic. Um, a lot of our immunoglobulins that we will use out there, uh, like IgY or IgGs that are from serum or um, from colostrum, they increase IL-10. So knowing if somebody is more Th2 tipped tells us, are they pre-autoimmune? Uh, it alerts us to the fact that we should be using more of these therapies and, and it helps us to calm this process down. Now, even when there's a high, like I said, only 50% of the time is that correlated with a symptom. However, it can still be creating inflammation in the body. And so let's say you saw a reaction like this, uh, that there is a high IgE, but they say to you, I don't notice that I've had clam chowder, I didn't have a problem for that. Well, just like we might not feel a CRP or we might not feel something like homocysteine, they're inflammatory markers. Sometimes we don't feel the inflammation going on. So it's my suggestion that we take out the high values of IgE to get the inflammatory load down. We work on building that gut lining. We work on things like the microbiome that will cause IgE titers to decrease, that will cause these things not to be a problem, whether or not the symptom is overt or not. Now, I mentioned that the whole point of, um, of desensitization is to increase uh, IgG4, which increases this IL-10. And that can be very interesting to some of you out there because you think IgG4. Yes, I know IgG4 because many food sensitivity groups will measure only IgG4. Well, that's going to miss majority of the sensitivity reactions. So IgG4 gained favor probably 10, 20 years ago. And the reason it began to gain favor is because people saw a correlation with IgE. And if we back it up 20 years ago, we know that there was even less acceptance of our star player over here, um, IgG immunoglobulins such as one, two, and three, which is what's predominantly measured here in the total IgG. So IgG4 started to seem to be this dark horse in the running. It seemed to measure mirror IgE. And if it mirrored IgE, maybe it would gain credibility in the sensitivity space. Maybe it would be the thing that would fill that next 50% where we knew people were having reactions to foods, but it wasn't showing up on IgE testing. So there was some early <clears throat> adaptation of IgG4 as a way to look at food sensitivities. But as we moved through understanding immunology, as we moved through understanding reactions to foods, we realized the reason that IgG4 roughly mirrored IgE, and roughly is, is, is a key word here, the reason for that is because it's not a bad guy. It's the way we become tolerant. So you have all had patients who have said to you, hey, yeah, I had a dairy allergy as a kiddo, but I grew out of it. And we often think, is that, you know, again, is that really possible? Can you grow out of it? Well, what the science tells us, and again, very heavily researched because it comes from the desensitization data, what the science tells us is that IgG4 is very different than its other brothers or sisters here in the IgG uh, family. IgG4 is smaller. IgG4 doesn't bind complement. IgG4 doesn't create a lot of inflammatory reactions. And in fact, IgG4 is largely made as a response to IgE. And the reason for that is because it blocks IgE from, from it, it, it sits in the IgE receptors and will block things from binding, preventing the mast cell from degranulating. And so it's the way that we become tolerant. So if I give desensitization injections, the whole intent of that therapy is actually to increase IgG4, which will sit in the receptor where IgE was going to bind and it will, it will block uh, thing, IgE from being 
being able to bind to that receptor and it will blunt allergic reaction. And in fact, in the research, what we see is when IgG4 is greater than IgE, it means that you have developed immune tolerance. And so you see that reflected in our test. If there is more IgG4 than there is IgE, you achieve an immune tolerance. And so we give you that here as an index. And so when you see reactions over here, then move your eyes to, well, that's okay if we have achieved this level of tolerance. And so we tell you, yes, you've achieved tolerance, but for example, here in the case of clam, very low amounts of IgG4, not enough to blunt this higher amount of IgE like you see here, this patient's in the, the top 99%. And so no, there's no immune tolerance. And so if we're only measuring IgE, then you're not, then you don't know if you've become tolerant to it or not. If you're only measuring IgG4 as a source of sensitivity, then that's also problematic because it's really not an inflammatory antibody. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So then from there, we go on to measure IgG, and this is predominantly subtype one, two, and three. And so when we're examining some of the reasons that IgG has struggled to gain respect in uh, larger communities out there. Uh, the answer is not that it, there's no research around it. That we can rule out. A criticism that is made, however, is that, look, if you measure all those antibodies together, you might as well be just lumping, it's like lumping HDL and LDL cholesterol together. Like you don't, you don't really know what's going on. If you put IgG4, an anti-inflammatory antibody, in the mix, you don't really get a clear picture. So we tease that out to answer one of the major objections to IgG in terms of sensitivity reactions. And as we can refine this testing, as we can improve what we're looking at, uh, we, can, we can gain credibility. And as credibility is gained, it means more people have access to these tools and ultimately less people are gonna have issues with spinach and almonds and foods we would want them to be eating, which we see more and more and more of. So uh, we, so it's not just your standard run of the mill IgG testing. It's much more specific looking at subtype one, two, and three. And subtype one, two, and three, they are inflammatory. They bind complement. They trigger these sensitivities that can happen three to 72 hours after the fact. And so, so we want to, they're important, uh, but we want to measure them correctly. So we also look at IgG. In addition to that, we look at a fourth reaction to food. So it's 88 foods and four ways you react to them. We also look at C3D. C3D is a fragment of complement. And if a food triggers both IgG and complement, it's going to be much more inflammatory than either alone. So when we're working with patients and really helping them try to understand what's the biggest deal for them, you know, when we see something like a moderate IgG and a high complement, when we see these combinations together, these are the ones that we want them to really focus on. Now, as I have gone through this, one of the things that uh, that uh, that you think about with that is you think about uh, the fact that, um, okay, that's a lot of information. And so as I have all this information and all these multiple ways that somebody can react to foods, that's likely to become confusing for the patient and it can be overwhelming. And so th that is certainly possible, but I wanna share with you, then we break it down. We make it simple and we say, okay, here are the foods where you have a high level of reactivity or a moderate level of activity with complement present. And we just give you these, these diets to end, or maybe you have somebody who's much more reactive um, or much, much sicker. And so we say, all right, now this elimination diet takes out your highs and your moderates and then rotates your lows with complement. So we give two diets to make it really simple and easy. Um, a, a trick that was taught to me by colleague and friend, Lee Russell, who's worked in this industry for uh, 30 plus years, helping people to understand foods and really um, brilliant mind. She says, never start off by showing them the things they can't eat. Fold this piece of paper in half. 
first, have them look at the foods over here uh, that they can eat and have them focus on that and say, do you see things you like to eat here? Good. These are the things that you're going to be eating. Focus on the positive first. Do you see things that you like to eat? And then after you have the buy-in, go, great. Now, these are the ones we're going to eliminate. I think that that's a, a beautiful technique and, and um, sets them up to feel better about what's going on. Um, but yes, yeah, so we look at these four different ways that you can react to foods. Are you allergic? Have you developed enough IgG4 to block the allergic reaction? Are you sensitive? And do you also have complement present, which will bind to IgG and amplify this reaction as much as a thousand fold? So when we look at this complete picture together, we can really hone in on what's going on. But another thing that I mentioned is, ah, it can become overwhelming. And we've all had these patients who just seem to react to everything. And you get back their food sensitivity testing, and it's lit up like a Christmas tree. And you're left with just only a handful of foods. And we would all agree five foods is not a healthy diet. And so we're left wondering, okay, what to do next? Well, another thing that we want to do for you, clinically speaking, is we want you to know how bad is that reaction? And so now they can look down and say, okay, um, I have a lot of moderates, but my moderate here to casein, I'm in the top 80%. So that is a bigger deal to me than, you know, well, at least than uh, the brewer's yeast or maybe than uh, the cabbage. So if I'm forced with the choice of something on the table that has a lot of dairy in it, and my two choices are some dairy product versus uh coleslaw with uh, with no dairy in it, uh, vinegar-based coleslaw, how about that? Uh, then of course I should choose the coleslaw. And so you can see uh, not only the reactions, but how reactive are they? And so again, this is a great tool for when we have patients that come back reactive to everything, they don't know what to do. And you can say, you know what? I want you to focus on things that are in 70th percentile and up. Now, the exact reference ranges are later on the pages. You can see those actual numbers. But what we thought was most important to the patient and to the clinician is to know how severe of a reaction is that. And so right here on the summary page, we give you that data. Then from there, a diet that only removes the highs and a diet that, that a choice of, of a diet that removes both the highs and the moderates. And so how, what will I do with these clinically? Well, in somebody who has more severe illness, uh, I will say to them, I really want you off these foods for six to nine months. And you can start, we, we might start to challenge the, the yellows in as much as three months, but I'm going to have them stick to this for a longer period of time. In my, in my earlier in my clinical uh, youth, um, and, you know, I'm forever the optimist. So I want to tell patients, oh, no problem at all. You'll be back to eating everything just a few weeks later. It's not the reality, uh, but what I do want the reality to be is what I said initially, that eventually you're eating more foods than you were with less discomfort than you had before. Now I will concede, um, I'm maybe not pulling in those highly allergenic things like wheat and dairy back to the previous standard American diet levels ever, um, but I am wanting to again, pull back in the spinach or um, the cantaloupe, or when we see some healthier foods that have to come out, of course we want those to come back into the diet eventually. And so why do I say six to nine months? Well, we're not just healing the gut. You're gonna heal the gut faster than that. They're gonna feel better faster than that but we're retraining the immune system. And think about when people do desensitization, they don't do that for three months or six months, even two years is even what's going on. So to really see those titers come down, to really see the immune system learn what it should be doing, longer avoidance makes good sense here. And that's gonna ultimately allow your patient to open their diet back up. Again, we wanna really figure out what's going on for them. So another thing we include is this immune index. And the immune index says, okay, it's a cumulative score of your IgE, your IgG, uh, your complement with a subtraction factor for IgG4. If there, there, there's a certain amount of IgE and it says, if we look at all of your antibodies together, now what seem to be your most reactive foods. So again, another way of being able to say, look, I know it's overwhelming, but look at the ones that are 80% and up. 
pay attention to these foods that are overall the most inflammatory for you. And those are the ones I really want you to make sure you're absolutely staying away from. It's never easy. Uh, if we wanted and the if you want an anti-inflammatory strategy that's easy, just dose, just 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 write them a script for high dose prednisone. That's going to be highly anti-inflammatory. However, it's going to come with plenty of side effects. And of course, I'm saying that tongue in cheek. But what we have all found in our community is these dietary changes can be as effective as something like high dose prednisone without the side effects, but with a little work involved. However, again, what most of us find is this work is empowering to patients. And if, when it, through good coaching and working with them, ultimately, uh, they're happier with us than otherwise. And what I see routinely with docs, the clinicians that talk to their patients about food, these are the practices that grow because patients know I, I must be something in my diet. There must be something that I can do. So when this conversation is completely neglected, that they go elsewhere to find someone who will have that conversation with them. Another thing that we do is we show you, okay, when you're, re it, of all the foods you're reacting to, do they have other compounds in common? Uh, are, are, are you reacting to a lot of oxalate foods? Are you reacting to a lot of foods with histamine in them? Are you re reacting to a lot of FODMAP foods? And so, for example, you look across this list, and well, this is a great list to have for our migraine sufferers who can have problems with amines and with histamine and food sensitivities in general. And so just another lens to let you see some patterns that are happening in terms of reaction. I think that this this is a secondary um, part in terms of what how you'd use it clinically. First, you just remove their higher levels of reactivity based on those diets. But then if they're not getting the improvement that you would expect, we can go back and look at some of these other patterns uh, for some more clues in terms of how we might help our patient. And then the test also shows you various families that you are reactive to. Now, um, I have never given my patient the advice that, that you can come off all vegetables, no matter how reactive they were there. So the ones that I find uh, most helpful are really um, the grain family and the fungus family. Now, this person's having more issues in terms of um, uh, fish, not, not shellfish, but the fish themselves. Uh, however, when we see this pull out towards fungus, these, this might be the person that we um, consider doing, for example, a low mold diet with, or if we see, if we saw this blue and yellow pull out towards the grain and grasses, and you're really looking for it to come all the way out uh, to this larger ring for the high level there, uh, then we would like this one does here, uh, then you would know, okay, maybe I want to put you on a grain free diet kind of thing. And so just trying to give you as, mo as many lenses as possible to look at where they're reacting, how they're reacting. No food test is ever going to measure every food. So understanding some of those food family uh, interactions can be useful as well. All right, so why did IgG fail to gain acceptance? And I can tell you, I've been following this research for 20 plus years because I've worked in labs before Precision Point. I co-founded Precision Point. Uh, so food sensitivity testing is something that I've had my eye on for a long period of time. Like I mentioned right out of school, I was convinced that the people that got the most improvement were the ones that really worked with their diet. And so why did it fail to gain acceptance? Well, one reason is that standard of care says we want a biomarker that represents a diagnosis or a symptom, cholesterol, hypercholesterolemia, um, high glucose, diabetes. IgG is not a particular diagnosis or symptom. However, that's a plus for us. IgE is showing us root cause. It's showing us something that's creating underlying inflammation and that inflammation cooking that patient's genetics to cause that pathology to express itself, to cause those symptoms to be worse. So it's not their specific ICD-10 code, but it's a, it's a process that makes it worse. So I'm fond of talking to patients about how there's a handful of processes that will be that fire to your genetics that can make things worse. Uh, it might be um, oxidative stress, or I tell them it might be the low levels of antioxidants, it might be poor nutrition, it might be high toxicity, it might be high mental emotional stress, and it might be high inflammation, and high inflammation is often gut-based and food-driven. And so for us, 
understanding that process, understanding where the root cause is, is not a problem at all, but quite a help. And so this is why we might use this testing for many types of conditions out there, because it will make many conditions worse. And we're going to dive into some of that research. Also, another pushback was, well, IgG just doesn't tell a coherent story. There are four types, and then one type does something radically different than the other three. And so this is why we tease that out to answer that objection. And then the final question is there data and and i would say yes there is data another question that i'll get is which food sensitivity test is the best and i and i don't think that there's an answer to that i think that that depends on the person and that depends on the pathology where's the immune confusion? If the immune confusion is there's antibodies that are cross-reacting and attacking the joints, like in rheumatoid arthritis, then we better measure antibodies. Um, however, there can be pathologies where the innate immune system is more out of balance. Well, the good news there is that complement captures that innate immune system activation. So not only are we looking at four ways the immune system re is reacting, but we're also capturing uh, that innate as well as that humoral so we're capturing the whole umbrella that, that the immune system goes through as it says it zero converts, as it moves down the spectrum to more maturity. And so again, just like in the world of cardiovascular disease, we're not all sitting around looking at cholesterol anymore. Well, and just like Journal of Immunology tells us, IgE will only capture something 50% of the time. We know there are other ways that we react to food. So measuring the whole immune system, not a piece, that's why we call it a system, and measuring those various components become quite helpful. If they're atopic, like eczema, I mean, we know that's more IgE. Um, we're going to look at the IBS and the migraine literature. That is uh, both IgE as well as IgG. Uh, if there's something that we're concerned about, innate immune system failure, then we have complement to help us capture that as well. And then, of course, IgG4 to help us show tolerance. But just at that moment that you think IgG4 is uh, just a, a good thing, which it is, you go, well, why do you have people, what's this column over here then? Why do you have people, why do you, so these are your IgG4 reactions. So we put them in a separate column. Why would you ever eliminate them though? Turns out there are a handful of IgG4 related disease. And some of the big ones are eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, and so I'm working with allergists, one locally here, and he's like, hey, he says, Cheryl, I've never been able to help these people without steroids. And it is by measuring IgG4 and removing these for those patients that I'm seeing such great improvement in terms of doing that. The other time you wanna think about IgG4 is when you are thinking about uh, the thyroid, autoimmune thyroiditis. IgG4 lodges in the thyroid and can drive that autoimmune component. Uh, and then it likes to, the other places it likes to lodge are the ovaries and the prostate. So think hormones, so reproductive tissue in general. So most of the time people don't need to take them out, but if they have a handful of conditions like this, then they do. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize all this. We have a very nice physician's guide that talks about conditions where each of these antibodies are more active. So you can refer back to it. And I wanna, I wanna make sure that you do refer back to it because I've got a lovely list of food families in there. You know, you're looking for a good place to just have a nice reference for food families. We've done some nice work for you there not just food family cross-reactivity, -reacti but environmental cross-reactions too. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. So uh, then the last question is, is there data? And, I'm, and I'm, I, wanna, I wanna move through this fairly quickly. So the reason you do wanna measure multiple antibodies is because they do different things. Uh, some people will say, well, IgG will only measure reactions to proteins. Well, that's not the case. IgG1 does measure protein reactivity, but IgG2 polysaccharides and IgG3 does both. IgG4 blunts IgE. And so like I mentioned, those are the major uh, areas that IgG4 lodges in. And uh, here are some of the conditions that are represented in the physician's guide uh, that you uh, is online. You can find it on our website and also we're happy to send it to you as well. So complement, like I mentioned, when that is present, it bridges that innate and acquired immunity. So you're not losing that innate piece and it will amplify that IgG activity a thousand to 10,000 fold. 
twofold. So in general, the immune system moves from innate to acquired. And so if we're only looking at one part of that, we're only going to find immune confusion in one part of that. Well, unfortunately, all along the way, the immune system can get confused. The innate immune system can get confused, begin to make complement. And the acquired immune system, of course, can get confused. These antibodies that will uh, that will cross-react and hit the tissue and react to the tissue. So in the physician guide, you'll see conditions driven by complement. Here's some fun cross-reactivity pieces. Uh, they've been off gluten for forever. They do not understand or and they do not understand why they still have a positive antibody to gliadin. Go look at the candida and we, we do do titers to candida as well. Yes, we realize people are not eating candida, but if you have candida present, the antibodies that you make to attack it can cross-react and attack gliadin. And look, this is from the Lancet, pretty high impact factor journal, um, as showing cross-reactivity, keeping your patients sensitized to that gliadin. So when there's a big gluten gliadin sensitivity, uh, if they show candida antibodies, running them through some treatment will be important here. Also, the other reason that we like to measure candida is because it chews up secretory IgA. And when secretory IgA goes down, that leads to an increase in IgG antibodies as well as IgE antibodies. So those patients that came off their food for that good nine months, they worked really hard and still their titers are elevated. That can be because their IgA was low. When your frontline defense is low, the backline immune system says, oh my gosh, the frontline soldiers aren't doing what they should. We need to amp up. We need to amplify ourselves. And so this can be a reason these titers stay elevated even when they come off foods. Some other fun cross-reactivity. Just was looking at this the other day in a patient. Um, uh, have it, have, they don't eat beef. Um, However, there's some cross-reactivity between beef and tick bites. And this is in very standard uh, in the Journal of Immunology, lots of publications around this. And this person was lighting up across the board to beef. And so this helped the practitioner learn, ah, maybe there was a tick exposure. And in fact, I uh, did go on to learn that the patient had bipolar as a major presentation and it turned out the treatment of Lyme plus food sensitivity removal was a big one. Um, uh, one of our um, dietitians who's happy to help you with these. Her name is Delma, and she reminded me just yesterday uh, that there's a cross-reactivity between pork and dog. So again, a patient doesn't eat pork. Well, if there's a dog in their house or they don't eat clams and that comes back positive, well, there's a cross-reactivity between this and cockroach. So again, visit our um, website. The, the physician guide will help you to have some of these environmental cross-reactivities that are so fun. Okay. That patient says, your test says I'm sensitive to clam. I never eat clam. Well, maybe there's a cross reactivity with something in the environment like shedding from cockroach, but sometimes we just make confused antibodies with amino acid structures that aren't perfect. So you can see that it's not necessarily the fault of the test. It's the fault of our imperfections. We just don't make a perfect antibody every single time. So here's an example of some of those environmental pieces that cross react with um, things in the environment. Uh, ragweed, Another big one it cross reacts with is, uh, is um, chamomile. So if you ever have your prescribing chamomile to help someone calm down and it amps them, it's likely they have a ragweed sensitivity too. And so this is what that guide looks like. And we've got, again, like some nice cross-reactivity lists in there that I think can just be so helpful clinically. Some nice food family lists in there uh, that can be so helpful clinically. And I just want to take a moment to say, yes, there is data around IgG, food sensitivity testing. I'm happy to give out these slides so you can pick and choose from them. But the next time somebody comes back to you and says, well, my doc said there's no data about that. Um, well, the best write-up that I ever saw that said there's no data about this came from an insurance company. Um, blues are in their name. And when I and they had all these references about how there's not any data. And when I went and looked at all those references, there was not a single one that was past 1986. Well, I would suggest that we've done some research in immunology since 1986. And what you can see is that there's plenty of data. So here uh, in patients with urticaria, what they saw was when they did not come back with IgE reactions, they had significant IgG antibodies to a number of different 
foods. And so, uh, so they're saying, well, hey, if you do allergy testing and nothing comes back, you need to look at IgG. Here uh, in depressive disorder, yes, when they compared depressive disorder to controls, there were higher level of IgG, uh, again, compared to those people that didn't have depression. Um, when you broke it down, when we look at migraines, there was much higher levels of IgG antibodies compared to controls. And uh, we know that there's a big connection with food from hypoglycemia to alcohol to chocolates, but IgG food sensitivities as well. Here, when they removed IgG, um, they saw an increase in serotonin levels in their blood. Well, we know that when people have huge, horrible migraines, they'll inject serotonin to pull themselves out of pain. The group that removed foods based on IgG saw serotonin go up in their blood. Uh, the group that used things over the counter, uh, they showed no significant difference. They also uh, did not show a difference, a decrease in migraines or gut symptoms, whereas the group that removed based on food sensitivity did. Uh, there's a, even ankylosing spondylitis, fusion of your bones, here, they saw that, that the ankylosing spondylitis patients uh, had much more IgG antibodies to foods uh, than healthy controls. And, and when, they, when there was an increase in IgG antibodies, there was also an increase in CRP demonstrating that there was inflammation with that. IgG antibodies created changes in the gut that were similar to celiac. So practitioners that are not testing IgG risk leaving the gut in a state of being ripped up that on biopsy can look like celiac. They saw uh, much higher uh, levels of, um, uh, of lymphocytes in the epithelial cells there when the IgG was present. And when I, when I, and here's the one that talks about, you know, standard IgE assays like from Immunicap, they just really aren't as sensitive. And so they're not showing the true prevalence of this in the population. They're not picking it up. So even though we see these conditions like EOE increasing, some of the testing is not keeping up with that. And so even they're looking at moving at a little bit um, uh, more complete piece here. If we look at um, RA patients, when they looked at their synovial fluid, as well as their gut, there are higher levels of IgG, uh, cross-reacting. So if it's a cross-reacting antibody, we want to be measuring antibodies. And here, celiac patients showing an, um, an increase in IgG, but reduced IgG4. Ah, they haven't developed tolerance. And so uh, more IgG in our atopic patients, like we would expect, higher IgG in patients with irritable bowel disease, higher in uh, patients that, uh, and compared to controls in this studies with irritable bowel disease, uh, in ulcerative colitis, higher levels of IgG, on and on and on. So when someone says there's a, here in autistic kiddos, higher levels of IgG antibodies, uh, when someone says there's no research in this, this is just a, 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 a small tip of the iceberg. Uh, again, non-celiac wheat sensitivity represented by IgG antibody testing and on and on. So um, I, so the, probably one of our last questions is, okay, so when do we want to retest? Um, interestingly, the half-life of IgE is only four days. Isn't that fascinating? And now you're sitting there going, yeah, but how about the kiddo who had the peanut, avoids it for 20 years, and then still goes goes into anaphylactic shock 20 years later. Well, that's because genetically his titer didn't calm down like normal. This is what happens normally. But when we have more pathology, we aren't normal. And so those titers can stay up longer. This is why, of course, we recommend doing things like not just food removal, but working on the gut too, reestablishing that microbiome as they'll bring those things down. So you want to wait at least three months to retest, but probably even six to nine months to really uh, retrain that immune system. Um, I have uh, some interesting Interesting comparisons here between other methodologies and why you might see different results. What we know is that we're using a monoclonal antibody system that has less cross-reactivity. Most use a polyclonal. It's cheaper. It binds to more things, but it creates a messier result. So that's some of the reasons some of these things can um, be worse. But, but again,
Why is it so bad? Well, our pesticides will, are, are, will still um, break down uh, the microbiome in the gut, medications that we're on, um, thing, other uh, alcohol, et cetera. All of this can make our food reactions more difficult, but ultimately the proof is in the dairy-free pudding. Do people get better when you remove these foods? So based on our testing, we did a study, this was published. They removed these uh, foods, some things that were most reactive, and this is their um, score for the previous symptoms, and this is their score afterwards. And so you can see radical reduction because anytime uh, we decrease inflammation, we can expect to see global improvements, not just in things like bloating and stomach pain, but even things like aching, cold intolerance, et cetera, et cetera. Food is one of our best tools for lowering that inflammatory load and helping our patients find optimal wellness. So uh, thank you for attending today and uh, I'm happy to answer questions. I uh, just want to remind you of that 50% off until the end of December. Hope you'll try out some of this new technology with us. Yes, Dr. Burdett, that was fantastic. So many compliments coming in through the chat, through the Q&A. So thank you so much. Folks, I know we're past the hour mark. So if you have to jump, no worries at all. We are recording this and we will make that available along with the slides uh, within the coming days once we've had the chance to uh, do a little bit of edits to it. But we had a ton of questions come in. Uh, so let's waste no more time and let's just jump right into it. Um, so this test focused a lot on IgG. How come it didn't do anything with IgA? Oh, that's an excellent question. The reason for that is that there is value to IgA. I'm not, I'm not going to deny that. Um, it, it, it's just also there's the logistics of finances. So when you added 88 more foods, uh, then, you know, that's, you're going to have probably a 20% increase just, you know, if we're looking at it that way. So we want to make sure that we're keeping things in a zone where it's most effective. We have done IgA testing in the past. The way IgA antibodies form is they, uh, they're not as much food specific. They more form as a group. And this is why they're our first line defense, because they're not as specific as the others. So you will see IgA reactions. Um, but what we saw was we weren't, they, they, there's, a, there's just inherently a little bit more cross reactivity. And so we found that it wasn't um, the most reliable in our system. But I think there are other labs out there that do a great job of it. We just found the ones that were most associated with symptoms, most represented with symptoms in the literature were, of course, IgE and Ig. E, and then also that, that complement and then blunting the allergies. Perfect. What have you found that increases secretory IgA? Oh yeah, this is a, you definitely, it's a, it's a definite go-to your simplest thing, most cost-effective, um, well, probably cleaning up the diet. Okay. That's the, uh, but this, is that going to simplest? I don't know. Most cost-effective maybe, um, but vitamin A is fabulous for increasing secretory IgA and in even very small amounts, 5,000 IUs, but I'll use 25,000 IUs. Um, Saccharomyces has great data in terms of increasing secretory IgA. Our fibers do, particularly arabinogalactins will do that. Um, and I love immunoglobulins for increasing secretory IgA. Perfect. Why should folks use this? There's, you know, of course, there are so many, um, you know, different tests out on the market. What about this particular test really kind of are, are, are you so passionate about? I think it's the most complete. And like I said, I come from a clinical background and the lab was birthed out of a clinical setting. And so we've used plenty of food sensitivity testing over the years and it always felt like we're missing certain things in certain people. Um, so, you know, you might think, I don't know about the allergies. How often is that relevant? Well, uh, a colleague who um, tried the test on herself, had fibromyalgia, unresolved, functional medicine, tried many things along the way and just wasn't getting anywhere. Well, she had an IgE reaction to cannabis. It was a low level. And she's like, I don't know. I eat cantaloupe. I'm okay. Fast forward a couple of years. Um, she is processing a lot of cantaloupe that day. She was freezing it or something and her hand started to blister. She thought it was some type of residue on the outside of the cantaloupe. Uh, like the true scientist she is, she went back and bought organic cantaloupe and did the same thing again and got the same reaction. She was like, huh, that IgE reaction that I don't notice because it's lower when I have enough exposure, I do get a reaction, took it out with some other things on the test and her fibromyalgia finally went into remission. So uh, even ones, so, so all of it's important. All of it can create inflammation. And so when we look at together, we can get the, the best picture. That's great. Um, what probiotic brands and dosage do you use? Hmm. 
Yeah, so I um, like a lot of different probiotics out there. I'm very fond of ProBioComplete, which is from Zymogen that has 18 strains in it, and it is uh, 40 billion CFUs, but uh, Microbiome makes a good one. Thrilac makes a good one. I'll often rotate things. Uh, those are a handful of my favorites. Beautiful. Dr. Burdett, what is the soonest turnaround time our patients could possibly see full reversal of food allergies if they do everything right? A few months, few years, what have you seen? Okay, well, and also good genetics in the mix, but if they have good genetics, they probably, they probably weren't having uh, pathology in the first place. But I think I think you start to see people feel better with even a couple of weeks. Uh, we all know this, like you'll do an elimination diet and they come back and they're already feeling better. And so that you can expect pretty quickly. Uh, it's the retraining the immune system that takes longer. It's the building the gut lining that takes longer. So even though they're feeling better, it's not time to, to pull it back in yet. They got to continue to really build up. Well, it's not a muscle, but build up that tissue to have that strength to be um, resistant to reactions. Perfect. Is there a minimum age to test? Well, uh, so I don't like to do people, you know, uh, you could if you really needed to, and especially with the stick technology, it's a little easier, but I like people to have more of a developed immune system. Um, when, when we're, you know, less than 12 months, we really don't have much of a developed immune system yet. So I might recommend at that point, especially if they're breastfeeding, um, might be more important to test mom. So I generally like to wait for their own immune system system to, to just be around to measure. Um, but um, so I'll often suggest to, but if someone's really struggling, then even after 12 months. Great. Uh, is it true that you need foods to be consumed within a couple of weeks to test in order for, to accurately reflect sensitivity or level of allergy? If so, how might we as practitioners delicately encourage that they eat as many foods in as many good groups before submitting uh, their sample to your lab? You're right. It's an absolute conundrum because we get people off these things and then we want to retest. And you're right that just removal can lower those anti that antibody response. Um, so yes, uh, a little bit of reintroduction. And I don't necessarily tell them they've got to um, do everything. I, I probably focus on the ones that were more inflammatory and were causing more uh, known symptoms initially. Uh, have, you know, So just a little little teensy bit of gluten or dairy somewhere before they redo the test to, to see what that reaction looks like. But yes, that's a problem with the human body for sure. Yeah, that's a tough one. Or, or, or how we test the human body, problem with one or the other. <laughs> yep. Yeah, uh, chicken or the egg. Um, if a food falls as an allergy and sensitivity falls under IgG uh, and complement, but show that they're ha they have developed tolerance, uh, would the IgG4 help reduce the inflammatory response to that food? No, it really only works for the IgE component. They still need to take that food out. Cool. If the test shows high reactivity and always meaning high inflammation, does this show in inflammatory markers like CRP or others? And if it doesn't, is it possible to have all that reactive inflammation, but have dealt with it properly? So absolutely, there. It, it is often the case that when there are more food sensitivities, CRP is elevated too. And in a number of those studies that I whizzed through, they use CRP as a corroborating marker to say, if you remove these foods, what happens to CRP? And as IgG went down and, and reactions went down, CRP went down as well. When the gut is leaky, it creates more IL-6 and that IL-6 sends a signal to the liver to, to make C-reactive protein. So um, that's the relationship there. And the second part of the question was, when do we know if all the inflammation is? Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, is it possible to have all of that reactive inflammation, but have dealt with it properly? Is it possible mm -hmm. to have that inflammation, but I've done everything correctly? Oh, sure. Yeah, you could, uh, yeah, you could just have poor genetics that put you in this situation or, um, you know, lots of pesticides on foods that wore the gut down kind of thing. Yeah. I, mean, I don't blame anyone for their food sensitivities. Just being under stress, less blood flow to the gut can make the, you're in fight or flight, not in rest and digest. And so it can make the, the gut more leaky. So, um, so you, so, so yeah, I think, but, but I do think removing the foods would, even if they don't have active symptoms at the time would still be preventative in terms of health. There are seemingly infinite variables to account for. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Can you repeat how long you tend to have people remove both moderate and high reactions? Yeah, so the high reactions, especially with aggressive symptoms, I'm going to encourage them to keep those out probably nine months. I'd probably say six to nine months to make it to sugarcoat it a little bit, but probably nine months is really what we're going to do there. And then the moderate reactions, three to six months. Perfect. How do you know when to retest? The best way would be is probably um, when symptoms are down. If you got lucky and and, um, you don't necessarily have to get lucky because this is another test that we do, but often uh, I'll measure zonulin at the same time because zonulin tells tight junctions to open. So we know the gut is leaky. Then once zonulin is down, now we know that there's not permeability. And so when that permeability has resolved, that's a great time to retest. But otherwise, outside of that, take your history. And when you see that they have become much less symptomatic, that would be a great time to retest. Perfect. Is a test showing sensitivity or allergies to any cooked foods or only raw? We're using raw antigens and there can be some slight differences. Interestingly though, um, some, some tests get less antigenic when they're cooked and some get more antigenic. So like, um, so, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's not all one direction. Like roasted peanuts get more antigenic, for example, but some proteins as they break down get less antigenic. So uh, we, but there's mainly overlap. They overlap more than they don't. Like you're not going to see a celiac patient, for example, that can eat bread, but uh, you know, but can't eat flour. That's that example doesn't make so much sense, but you get what I'm saying. I get what you're saying. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I know you mentioned this, but how do these folks get access to the physician's guide? Ah, they, they, I bet you guys have it over there at Rupa Health if they wanted it. And if you don't, I'll send it to you. Um, But it's also on our website, uh, Precision Point Diagnostics. Go to the education tab and then go to resource tab. And maybe I can throw it up in the chat box too, if I'm really clever here. I I could see the navigation in your brain happening in real time. That was fantastic. (laughs) So this is a bit of a... A, good, a great question, I, I think. Um, so if we have patients with a lot of candida present, should we wait until after we get those levels back to normal range in order for food sensitivities to reflect accurately? If so, how many weeks or months after normalizing can we take the test with confidence in the results? You'll often have a synergistic effect of doing both together because when you remove the foods that you're sensitive to, it's one more way that you're allowing secretory IgA to improve. It's one more way that you're allowing the microbiome to improve, and both of those things will compete with candida. But you're right, candida creates an uphill battle because, like I said, it chews up the secretory IgA, which can make us more reactive. But your best approach is generally to do both at once. Great. How do you treat leaky gut? Mm. Uh, many ways, as you might imagine. Um, uh, so I want the least inflammatory diet possible. So I'm using this to remove uh, things they're allergic to and that they're sensitive to. I'm, of course, a huge fan of, of glutamine most of the time, as I'm sure everybody out there is. And I like to see at least four grams, but I'll often go up to 10 grams. I'm using um, nice um, 18 strains in my probiotics. I find that diversity is really good. And that's a very familiar list to everyone listening. The one thing that I that I saw really start to lower these food sensitivities when introducing it, um, uh, immunoglobulins. And so I use some that are egg-based. They're, they're, the IGY is the, is not, it's not a product name. That's the type of immunoglobulin. And the um, reason that it does that is first of all, but you can get immunoglobulins like colostrum based or serum based, but all of them, first of all, sit in the receptor where zonulin was going to bind and block zonulin. So you see this immediate closing of tight junctions. The second thing is they increase that secretory IgA. The third is that they wall off bad bacteria. Um, so there's, and the, the kind of when you're thinking about, well, why do these immunoglobulins work? It's somewhat like breastfeeding. So when we breastfeed, the body's getting all these immunoglobulins with the food. And so it says to those Peyer's patches in the gut, it goes, ah, I see good immune function and the food. I'm not going to react to this. So when we give those immunoglobulins with um, foods that we um, are, are, or well, uh, we take the foods away, but even maybe when you're reintroducing, that's a great time to use it. But 
when your body sees those immunoglobulins with foods, it's the key to say, oh, this is normal. I shouldn't react to it. So I've really um, right up there as strong as glutamine and probiotics. So that those immunoglobulins are really important for me. Perfect. And we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, one question is, is there an assessment questionnaire that would help to decide which patients would benefit? Um, I do have some gut-based um, questionnaires that I could share. It's not routine, but uh, if, if they, do you want them to email you guys or us at Precision? What we can have them reach out. Um, so if the person who asked this question, I believe they're still online, uh, go ahead and shoot me an email and then I'll, I'll coordinate with Dr. Burdett to get any okay. uh, collateral over to you, including, of course, the copy of this recording in slides. Uh, final question we've got time for here uh, is, uh, this is a very great question, more so just because it's complimentary of you. This is a brilliant talk. Thank you so much. Question, is there anything here for reactivity to aspirin? Uh, they have a patient who with chronic nasal polyps and conventional Rx is re-exposing them to aspirin with dire consequences. Ah, so that's a tough one. I would, I would still think about immunoglobulins and I would definitely do all of my uh, glutathione therapies because at least it's going to move it more from, it's going to remove it more from the system. Um, also, when we increase glutathione, uh, that's another thing that calms down those T cells that got all activated and that are, that are responsive to whether or not it's food or a medication. So those would be my two strategies, anything to up glutathione and immunoglobulins. We love some good glutathione. Um, well, Dr. Burdett, those are all the questions we have time for today. Uh, folks, if you have a few minutes, what I'm going to do is after we give uh, Dr. Burdett's final uh, moments to say thank you, I will show you exactly how to order this test directly on Rupa Health and take advantage of that 50% off. So if you're not familiar with the Rupa Health platform, stick around. It'll only take about eight minutes and I'll show you everything you need to know. But Dr. Burdett, thank you so much for joining us today. Do you have any final thoughts or messages for the people who are with us? We still got well over 100. Just, I always love being part of this community. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, when it all gets confusing, um, a little bit of testing, love your patience. And as my favorite professor, Alan Gaby said, the rest you can look up. I love it. Well, we appreciate your time. I know this is, uh, you know, takes a lot of time out of your day, the preparation. And thank you not only to you, but the team over at Precision Point. We love being partners with y'all, which is why we have this partnership in place and this amazing opportunity for everybody joining us today to get 50% off this test. So what I'm going to do, and you're welcome to stick around or you can hop off Dr. Burdett, but I'm going to still the screen for just a few minutes. And I'm going to show y'all exactly how to order this test directly on Rupa Health. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'm the head of practitioner partnerships here at Rupa Health. And really what my role here is besides hosting these fantastic webinars is to ensure that you as a practitioner are set up for success. And so with that, we're going to transition. I'm going to show you exactly who Rupa Health is and how you can order the test that Dr. Burdett walked us through today. So Rupa Health is a functional medicine lab platform. We are designed with the mission and goal of bringing functional medicine to the world. Right now, there are a lot of different pain points associated to lab testing. You know, on the practitioner side, you might be working with anywhere from four to six or maybe even 10 different labs at any given point, which means that you have to set up those different accounts, manage those logins, go to them to order your test to manage your results. It can be a pain in the butt. Right. Not only that, but on the patient side of things, these tests can be very expensive. Uh, the patients have a lot of questions and they're coming to you for support, which can take up a lot of time. What if there's a specimen issue? What if there's a blood draw or phlebotomy required? Right. All these things ultimately create friction within your business. And so our platform is designed to alleviate that friction. As simple as that. And the way that we do that is a number of different ways. For you as a practitioner, what we've done is you created a platform, essentially a marketplace that has brought on over 30 plus different labs. So now instead of having to go to each individual portal to place your orders, you have a one-stop shop. This is the Discovers Labs tab. As the name implies, this is where you can discover all the labs that we work with, all the tests that we offer. You can do things like searching by specific test, or you can browse by category or even by biomarker. You can hop down and see a full list of all the labs that we work with, of course, including Precision Point, 
all available right here. And within a matter of seconds, you can order from all of these labs without having to go to each individual portal to do so. We even have amazing comparison tools. So if you're interested in comparing different tests on our platform, maybe you want to see all the GIs that we offer, you can get just the raw data of seeing, hey, here's the test, here's the cost, and here's what it's testing for without having to go to each individual lab to do so. We stay agnostic, right? And so we're just providing the raw data. Now, what I'll do next is show you exactly how to place the order and how simple it is. To start an order on Rupa Health, all you need is the patient's first name, last name, and email address. It's as simple as that. You don't have to have the whole patient file on hand. You just need to know their first name, last name, and email, and we do everything else directly with the patient to save you time and ensure the accuracy of that information. This is the order screen. It's very customizable. You can do things such as creating custom bundles. So if there's sets of tests from various labs that you want to create one bundle for, you can add them into a bundle, and that way it's one click in that kit and sets of kits are added into your cart straight away. Below that, you can create a favorites list. So individual tests that you're commonly ordering or want to order, you can add a heart next to it. That way it appears at the top. And that way, if I want to add that P88 DIY test that we were just talking about this afternoon, you can click that there. But you can also choose from any set of tests that you want to from any lab that we work with. And if that's it, it's as simple as clicking send a patient. That's how you order from Rupa Health and from 30 plus different labs, of course, including Precision Point within a matter of seconds. But going into a bit more detail for you, you'll see here that that 50% off is automatically applied to this test. So you don't have to do anything that 50% that, uh, goes through the rest of the month through the end of December. Think of it almost like a holiday launch discount available for you. You simply just add that into your cart straight away. Our pricing simple. Rupa Health is free to sign up for y'all. Um, it costs nothing to sign up for Rupa Health. You simply just need to be a practitioner and you actually have to be within the United States currently. Um, if you are servicing patients in New York, New Jersey, or Rhode Island, unfortunately you can't work with Rupa at this time, but anywhere else within the United States, you can work with us. The way that we generate our revenue right? Of course, we are a business. There's a flat 7% processing and ordering fee on each order, but this is paid for by whoever pays for the tests. So if you're having us bill the patient directly, which we can do, the patient will be the one paying, in this case, $12.57. That's the cost to use Rupa. So that processing and ordering fee is how we generate our revenue. You do have the option of paying for the tests yourself. In that circumstance, the cost remains the exact same. You would simply just bill the patient separately outside of our platform. You can add notes for the patient, notes for Rupa. You can even add ICD-10 codes. So if your patient does want to submit a super bill to their insurance for potential reimbursement, we will automatically create that super bill and go ahead and send that to the patient, making things even more simple for the patient as well as for yourself. You just need to add those ICD-10 codes. But if that's it, send a patient. Now, that's how you order the test on Rupa Health, but what I want to show you just very quickly as well is a very important component to Rupa Health, and what that is, is the patient experience. So this is another huge value add that Rupa provides, and that means, what I mean by that is, as soon as you press send on that order, we can take it from there. We'll reach out to the patient. We can manage billing directly with the patient. We'll ship the kits to the patient as well, so you don't have to stock any kits in office, never have to worry about them taking up space or them going bad and expiring. We'll send over instructions and FAQs. We'll walk the patient through how to take the test. If they have any questions, they reach out to our team and we'll facilitate the support directly with the patient. We'll check in and follow up with them as well, right? I feel like that is such a simple step in the process and the patient experience, but can so easily be just overlooked. Hey, how are you doing? Do you have any questions? We will do that. And then from there, you're notified as the results come in. I'll show you how to check those in a minute. But this is what it looks like. We'll reach out to the patient. We'll say, hey, patient, the doctors ordered these tests for you. We'll introduce who we are. And then a really, really great component to Rupa is that we offer multiple different payment solutions. Unfortunately, at this time, the cost of tests can be very preventative and prohibitive for patients being able to simply just take these tests. They're expensive, right? And so we offer multiple different payment solutions, not only crash or credit or credit or debit, but we can accept HSA, we can accept FSA. And additionally, we can even set up a three-month interest-free payment plan with the patient to pay for the tests. Again, we can set up a payment plan with the patient to pay for the tests spread out over three months interest-free. We'll collect all the necessary information to complete the order. 
If you're paying for the tests, no worries at all. We will go ahead and just simply collect all the necessary shipping information since you're paying for the test. We're not going to collect any billing information from the patient or show them the cost of the tests. Additionally, one thing I forgot to mention is you can also add your own fees. So if you want to add interpretation fees or anything like that, you can actually add that to Rupa uh, in the order. The patient will pay that. You'll connect your bank account. And so you can still create and connect uh, your bank account to uh, build additional revenue for your business through the Rupa Health profile. From there, we'll ship over those instructions, ship the kit to the patient. As I mentioned before, answer any support questions they have. You can see our instructions over here on the right-hand side. We've created these ourselves. They're very comprehensive, but what I think is also equally as important is just how user-friendly they are. Um, but again, if the patient does have any questions, they'll reach out to our team. We'll walk them through how to fill out the requisition form. And if there's a blood draw required, we can help, even help coordinate their blood draw. From there, follow up with the patient, and then you're notified as the results come in. So once those results are in, you just hop right back into your main dashboard here, and you're able to view all of your results straight away. You can download the results. You can send them to the patients. You can even schedule clinical consultations with the lab to help interpret those results. So should you need some assistance interpreting those results, you are still able to work with a clinician at the lab that you ordered the tests from. You're not losing anything that you would be losing or gaining working directly with the lab by working with Rupa. That's the goal here, right? We just want to be a complement to your business that's going to make things more streamlined and bringing you into the 21st century. We even have integrations with EHRs. So if you do work with an EHR, such as OptiMantra or Practice Better and a handful of others, we can actually connect the Rupa Health account to your EHR and have those, um, have those results flow directly into the patient profile. So what I've shown you so far is one, how to order from 30 plus labs in a matter of seconds, of course, including precision point. Two, how to track and manage all of your results in one place. Three, how to have your patient experience taken care of and well taken care of. And the last thing I wanna show you here, y'all, is Rupa University. So beyond just a place where you can come and order all your tests in one spot, we wanna be a, be a platform where you can come and continue to learn. You're all actually a part of Rupa University right now. So what it is, is education, right? So we create these webinars with all of our partners, as you just saw with Dr. Burdett, but really basically every lab that's on our platform, we've created uh, content with them, whether it's a webinar, whether it's an article, and we even have paid boot camps. So if you are interested in more of a deep dive, we offer paid options where you're able to join our team, Dr. Kerry Jones, among a handful of other labs and representatives from those labs to do six-week deep dive coursework into how to best interpret specific labs in specific scenarios. So with that, y'all, uh, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'm going to go ahead and share my information real quick up here. But if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm more than happy to walk you through the platform, get you signed up, answer any questions that you have. My email is simple. It's just adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N, at rupahealth.com. Shoot me an email, give me a call, shoot me a text, tweet me, whatever whatever the best method to get in touch you prefer, I'm available. Um, but I thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and I look forward to working with a lot of you and very excited for, for you to take advantage of that 50% off, you know, basically coupon that we're offering through the end of this year. So, you know, with that, y'all, I'm going to hop into the chat for the last few minutes here and see if there's any questions for me. Can you order as an unlicensed practitioner? Great question. So we actually have a program called Physician Services. What Physician Services? And to answer your question, yes. So Physician Services is a program where you, if you are a practitioner, whether you're licensed or unlicensed, but essentially if your certifications uh, prevent you from ordering specific tests, we can partner you with a licensed physician who would be able to order those tests on your behalf. I won't go through all the details, but if you do have any questions or want to set up time to uh, go through what that program looks like in more in depth, uh, more than happy to do so, uh, because there are definitely some details that are important to go through. So before signing up or, or, or doing anything like that, I would love to set up some time with you. How much does the test cost? Great question. Let's come back into that order. So the test costs through the month of December. Remember that we're going 50% off. $179.50. Cost $179.50, but normal price is $359. So if you are interested in using this test, uh, be sure to you know get that uh, through before the end of the month. Does group of market to patients? Uh, no. So in terms of market to patients, we don't have any direct to patient 
um, services. So you need to be a licensed practitioner or a practitioner in order to use Rupa Health uh, or, or rather order tests from Rupa Health. So there's not a, a ton of uh, reason for us to do a ton of marketing. So does the discount apply for multiple tests patients? Yes. So it just doesn't matter how many you order, the, the coupon, the 50% will be through this. Do we uh, integrate with Jane? Not currently, um, but we are in talks with a number of uh, EHRs that um, are in the works and conversations, but you know those integrations are definitely something that we are focusing on. Do you need to have a business license? Nope, you don't need to have a business license if you are a licensed practitioner. What you need to have is essentially a license, right? The big thing for us was previously an NPI uh, prior to releasing the physician services uh, program. But the idea here and, and the way that Rupa truly works to its core is if you're able to order the test directly from the business, uh, from the lab rather, uh, then you can order the tests through Rupa Health. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith. Yeah, so <laughs> Servo is definitely one of the big ones. Try to hold that one a bit close to the chest because sometimes you don't necessarily know what the exact launch date of that, those integrations can be. Uh, but yeah, we are in talks with Servo, absolutely. No, 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 you didn't do anything wrong. Absolutely not. Um, but, you know, there's always questions you always, you know, I, I try to avoid any promises of timelines, especially being in specific uh, industries that require integrations. I know things can sometimes get held up. Uh, Serbo is an EHR. Uh, it's a rather big EHR. And so we get a ton of requests. Uh, or we've received a number of requests regarding their integration. And so that's why we operate primarily on, hey, we gathered the information. How much are, are we hearing about this specific business, so on and so forth. And so that's usually how we make the decisions. And that actually leads me to another really good call out is uh, feedback. You'll see the share feedback button here. We pride ourselves on building our business off of feedback we receive. Um, and so if you you know, sign up for Rupa, when you sign up for Rupa, if you do have any feedback for us, please don't hesitate to let us know. Um, we love to hear it. Um, and even scheduling time with Frankie, who I actually have a meeting with right now uh, to talk about feedback, please feel free to provide us feedback uh, because we love it. Um, but with that, y'all, again, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'm going to put my contact information up here one more time. Um, I've got to run, but you know, again, we do these meetings or we do these webinars every single week. We actually have two next week, uh, one with Dr. Uh, Dick and Weatherby and another one uh, with another partner of ours. So if you are interested, check them out, rupauniversity.com. You can always see the upcoming webinars. You get to see me. You get to hear some awesome conversations. Um, but you know, we appreciate you, genuinely appreciate you joining us today. Uh, but if you do have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. And if I don't see you, happy holidays. Enjoy your uh, December. Take care, y'all.